Time is running out for Gaza's population of 2.3 million people as famine threatens to engulf the entire enclave that's been battered by war for months. A United Nations-backed report predicts a famine could strike as soon as this May if Gaza doesn't see a massive surge in aid. But remember, once a famine strikes, this is already after people have been starving for some time. Aid workers say Palestinians are already dying of hunger, especially as aid trucks are held up outside of Gaza. The U.N. chief, Antonio Guterres, who was visiting Egypt's border with Gaza yesterday, described the line of blocked aid trucks as a moral outrage and remained firm that most of the international community stands with Gaza. Meanwhile, the United Nations continues to call for a ceasefire, hoping to put a stop to the bloodshed that has consumed tens of thousands of Gazans since October. A potential ceasefire deal remains elusive as talks between Hamas and Israeli officials reportedly stalled on Saturday. On Friday, both Russia and China vetoed an American-backed United Nations resolution that called for an immediate ceasefire. It's worth noting that while this language is in the resolution is stronger than anything the U.S. has backed up until now, there are some critics who argue it wasn't strong enough. The war, now in its sixth month, uh, sixth month, has claimed the lives of more than 32,000 Palestinians, about 70 percent of whom are women, children and the elderly. Those numbers, according to the Gaza Health Ministry. Hamas announced on Saturday that one more Israeli captive has died from hunger and a lack of medicine. Also yesterday, the health ministry says an Israeli airstrike killed 19 Palestinians and wounded nearly two dozen more near Gaza City while they were waiting in line for aid. And more violence could be on the horizon. Netanyahu says he will move ahead with his planned invasion of Rafah, a city in the south, despite U.S. disapproval and despite the fact that it's where Israel told Gazans to move to to get away from the military targets in the north. Several human rights organizations last week, including Human Rights Watch and Oxfam, urged the United States to immediately halt sales, uh, arms sales to Israel, saying that Israel's written assurances to comply with international law are not credible. With more on these latest developments, I'm joined by Peter Beinart. He's an editor at large at Jewish Currents, an MSNBC political analyst and the author of the book, The Crisis of Zionism. I don't know where to start, Peter. There's a, there's a lot in there. Um, I don't want to say we're at a turning point because for 32,000 Gazans and the Israeli hostages and the October 7th attack, these were all turning points. What do you make of where we are right now and what could possibly happen? We're already into one of the greatest humanitarian catastrophes of the 21st century. Um, the question is that the Biden administration is really on the precipice. They've really, they've been asking Benjamin Netanyahu in every possible way to not go into Rafa, and they've been trying to get a ceasefire. This, we don't have a ceasefire, and Netanyahu says he's going to go into Rafa, and we're on the brink of all-out starvation. He has to use the leverage that America has. It's not complicated. With some countries in the world, we may now have choice, no choice but simply to ask because we don't have any leverage. These are our weapons. We don't have to send them to Israel to use to slaughter Gazans. We protect Israel in every major international forum. We can change the calculus dramatically for Benjamin Netanyahu if he knows that there will no longer be international impunity for Israel's actions and America won't continue to supply weapons. Biden is on the precipice of that decision. He has to make it. And you're seeing cracks, right? You saw Chuck Schumer, who has never had any space between himself and Israel, even with Netanyahu. I mean, there have been a couple of things, including when Netanyahu came to uh, the U.S. in 2015 and spoke to Congress uh, in spite of uh, not being invited or, or, or not having good relations with Obama. Schumer even supported Netanyahu in that case. Schumer was not acting alone. Schumer, the highest ranking Jewish right. elected politician in America, was clearly not acting out of sync with the White House in criticizing Netanyahu in calling for new elections. Netanyahu must see that this is happening. Why isn't there any substantial movement on his side? Well, but a fight with the United States, if the United States is not using its actual leverage, isn't necessarily so bad for Netanyahu and his right-wing base. He can say, I'm refusing this outside pressure, and the pressure is just rhetorical. What really changes things inside Israel 
is if there's a material change in U.S. policy. What I didn't like about what Schumer did is it's not actually America's place to tell Israel to go to elections. It's America's place to decide on our policy. That's what Schumer should have focused on, the question of military aid. Now, the Israelis are saying we have to go into Rafah because we have to destroy Hamas. Right. But if you listen to any Palestinian, you listen to them, they will tell you that this slaughter, which would continue in Rafah, will only create more danger for Israelis. It's not wise for Israel's security, let alone the survival of Palestine. So let's spell that out a little bit, because this discussion has been going on since October 7th, right? right? And that is that uh, uh, Israel said our goal is to destroy Hamas. Right. And despite the, the strong embrace by Joe Biden and by Tony Blinken, and everybody else in this administration, there was disagreement on that goal right from the beginning. Right. Because Hamas is complicated. It right. is a, it's as much an ideology as it is an organization. Right. They disagreed with the end goal in the war. Netanyahu uses the end goal, which is an almost impossibility to achieve, yes. to justify continuing this war. Right. Look, what Hamas did on October 7th was evil. Hamas's ideology for someone like me who believes in equal citizenship and secular democracy is profoundly disturbing. But Palestinians have been fighting Israel since long before Hamas. The violent attacks of the 1970s, for instance, the terrorism of the 1970s, Hamas didn't exist back then. So if you think your problem is going to be solved just because you get rid of Hamas, even if you could get rid of Hamas, misses the larger point. Unless Palestinians have a path to freedom that is that shows that, they're, that they can take ethical, nonviolent actions towards their freedom, they will be fighting you militarily. And it, the more people you kill, the more of a desire for revenge there will be. Even if it's not called Hamas, it's called something else. Israel couldn't imagine anything worse than the PLO when it went into Lebanon in the early 1980s. It got Hezbollah. Right. This is the danger. Let's talk about whether or not, if you take the optimistic glass half full view, that there is an opportunity here for everybody involved to say this is too much, this has gone too far, enough people are dead on all sides of this thing. Can there be a future, like the United States is postulating, of a, a real path toward a two-state solution uh, with whomever that involves? It's not, not likely to involve Hamas or Netanyahu, but Maybe there could be a future. Is that possible? Do you think it's foreseeable that this terrible stuff that has happened in the last several months could lead to something more successful? To go down that road, the first thing you need to have is legitimate Palestinian leadership. Most of the most popular Palestinian leaders are in jail. They, you need to let some of those people out. And yes, some of those people were involved in violent acts. Uh, but those are the people who have the credibility. Mahmoud Abbas has no credibility. Hamas, his ideology is very problematic. And most Palestinians are not Islamists. You need to have to recreate the PLO as an umbrella for Palestinian leadership. Which is a, 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 a sect, uh, non-sectarian organization. Yes, it involves all yes. the parties. Yeah. And then for them to lay out a vision. I don't know at this point whether they will still stick to two states or whether they will revert back to one equal state which was an earlier Palestinian vision, but you need the Palestinians to lay out what they want, how they want their freedom, and that's the beginning of getting anywhere. I think that's an important discussion for us to have, the concept of a two-state solution, which is what America continues to try to say that they're yes. pushing versus an increasing number of people, again, across this political spectrum in, in Israel and Palestine who yes. think a one-state solution might be a better idea. Uh, thank you. We're going to be actually talking about Marwan Barghouti and some of those uh, imprisoned Palestinians Great. in the next hour. Peter, good to see you as always. See you. Peter Beinart is the editor-at-large of Jewish Currents, an MSNBC political analyst and author of the book, The Crisis of Zionism.